Welcome to the Art and Science of Complex Sales. This is a podcast where we explore how the best B2B sales leaders make the complex simple, drive relationships and revenue, and generally elevate the sales profession. In this podcast, we're bringing together sales experts, thought leaders, top account executives, buyers, industry insiders, all to share their experiences and best practices for navigating the complex sales cycle. So whether you're a seasoned sales professional, a sales leader, or just starting out, you're going to find practical insights and actionable advice that you can apply to your own sales journey. Plus, we have a bit of fun. Ashley Welch is bringing design thinking to sales teams to enable excellence. Using the mindsets and tools of design thinking, she helps guide sales organizations to unleash their inner creative power and helps them wildly accelerate revenue growth. Co-founder of Somersault Innovation, she believes sellers should be co-creators of innovative solutions with their customers in a way that generates greater trust, impact, and opportunity. So let's dive in as Ashley helps us understand the impacts design thinking can have on our results and much more. Ashley, welcome to the Art and Science of Complex Sales. How the heck are you today? Yeah. Hi, Paul. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. And uh, you're in the northeast side of the country for in the U.S., right? Yeah, I'm right outside of Boston, about 30 minutes west. Three minutes west of Boston. So a lot of chowder. <laughs> A lot of chatter. Yeah, closer to the city and on the shore. So not so much in my home, but yes, lots in, in the surrounding area. That's awesome. Well, um, one of the questions that I often start with on this is, and by the way, thank you for so much for joining us. We had we had an awesome uh, conversation prior to this. I'm excited yeah. for what you're going to bring and share. But how did you how did you find yourself working in this crazy world of sales? Yeah, it's a good question. I think I've always been very entrepreneurial by nature. So I'm always thinking up ideas, many of which I see come to life by other people in the newspaper. I just saw one the other day and I was like, darn it, I have really thought of that. <laughs> that was um, my idea. <laughs> that was my idea of the individual pizza. Um, so, uh, but I started working at a consulting firm 25 years ago, at least, um, longer actually. And I had thought I wanted to be a consultant, but I sort of had knocked on their door and said, I'll take any job you've got. And they said, okay, fine, you can support these two people who are sellers. And so it was really old school sales in terms of sort of like the front end of sales. And they would go in and whip things up. And then I had I was behind the scenes and would actually write the proposal and make things happen. So after a while, I was thinking, well, I still want to go into consulting. And they said, no, you don't. You want to go into sales. You're good at this. And it's where the money is. And we think you'll be happy. So anyway, long story short, I did. And I just stayed and I loved it, I think, because it was very entrepreneurial and I could make sort of my own relationships and community and uh, build success in the way that I knew how to. So that's where I started. So what what type of consulting, just from for background, what type of consulting were you selling? Yeah, it was leadership development. So it was sort of all oh, things. Oh, that's awesome. Management. So how to be a better leader, how to be a better facilitator, how to set up high performing teams, that kind of thing. That's fantastic. I see how that can, and that directly relates into one of the things I don't think we ever talked about. My my definition of sales, and I'm going to ask you to, to define sales here, but my definition of sales, leadership has a big component of it. I think uh-huh. it's, I just give three words when people ask me to define it, which is leadership, service, and wayfinding. Uh-huh. I think they, I think you have to lead other mm. people to their vision, right? You have to, mm-hmm. to, service is a big component. You help serve them to get the, what they need. And then wayfinding is finding the path. Mm-hmm. But how do you define, let's set that stage. How do you define sales? Have you come to a definition in your, in your time in the business? Yeah. I don't know that I have a specific definition, but I have some ideas and words that come to mind. So I think really at the end of the day, it's about a building a relationship that adds value on both sides. And so mm-hmm. I don't, I sort of cringe at this notion of influence or challenge. Like I think the best salespeople aren't here to like influence you to do something or challenge you to see that you are wrong and I have the way, but rather to say, let's build a relationship if we trust each other and you or I have something of value to offer, then let's figure this out together and sort of we both win in that way. So I think it's about relationship and I think it's about building value. And if you can do that, both of those, you're pretty, probably pretty good at sales. (laughs) The, those are two questions, and excuse me, because I'm going to dive into those. You use two words there that I'm going to dive in a little bit more on because I think they're important. And they're two words that I hear a lot, but 
people use them differently. Mm -hmm. So number one is relationship. What does Mm -hmm. that mean in the context to you in the context Mm -hmm. of sales? Yeah. Well, I'll just speak to me for me personally um, in my, I've been in sales, as I said, for decades now. For me, I've always felt like first and foremost, I wanted to build a real, an authentic, real relationship with the person I was looking. I mean, I would sort of either selling to or working with. And that means that not, we at least value each other. We trust each other. We have we've gotten to know each other a little bit. And it's not transactional. There's something legitimate about our relationship uh, that that perhaps even lasts longer than the sale. I feel like the, so many of my friends have come out of the sales process. Um, and I'm always looking to find something interesting about the person I'm quote unquote selling to is far beyond what I'm selling. Awesome. And that, uh, that leads me to the second mm-hmm. question, the uh, second word that I guess gets thrown around a lot, but not a lot of people agree on what it means, which is value. Yeah, well, it's a good question. And I think just like many things, like value is uh, determined by the person with whom is going to receive the value. So if I'm selling something to you, they need to articulate what the value would be and then determine whether they received it or not. So I think value is determined by the customer in a sales situation not necessarily by me. I can tell you all day long why I think it's valuable. It's actually interesting because right now we've just done this big initiative with a big tech firm, and we think we've provided great value um, based on what they spent and what they got in terms of return. Uh, but now we're having a conversation actually tomorrow to say, okay, we see this as valuable, but what are your finance people going to see as valuable? What do they want to see as the return on investment here? And let's make sure we understand in their eyes what value is. That's a great answer. I did. I did a. Uh, it's a long time ago. Um, I did this piece that I called "Value is in the Eye of the Beholder," and mm-hmm. it exactly it was exactly that. And it's. Uh, it was. It was in. It was actually in response to to uh, an email that I got that somebody said, "Well, you're going to find so much value in this, mm-hmm. and it's going to be amazing, and it's yeah. going to change your life, and all this." I'm like, I don't get it. Yeah, I know. <laughs> like, I don't want any of that stuff. Yeah, uh, exactly. I try to stay away from hyperbole in sales because I think it's very easy either to get excited or want to excite the other person with all the things we believe. But um, it's easy to say it's amazing. It's great. It's impressive. And uh, that's my view. It's not necessarily yours. Well, so let's dive in because you have one of the things I'm really interested about in your approach to sales is this concept of uh, design thinking. Mm-hmm. Um and do you mind diving in and giving us an overview of how you approach and how you leverage this idea? First, what it is, yeah. and then how it's leverageable by by sales organizations. Sure. So, simply, design thinking is a, sol- a problem solving process. So it's about solving a problem or a challenge or taking advantage of an opportunity and figuring out how to uh, sort of meet that opportunity. And it tends to be a five step process more or less with different different tools and techniques in each stage and i've put it in the category at least in the business world of like lean six sigma agile it's just another process that people use to innovate and solve problems Um, i think what's different about design thinking is it's sort of ruthlessly customer centric which means as i am solving the problem or as i'm innovating I'm constantly thinking about, well, what does my customer care about? What's their point of view in this, not what's mine? Or what, not what's my company's, but what's my customer's? Just to give an example, there's a great Bank of America example that they came up with, um, Keep the Change Initiative, which mm-hmm. is basically you spend $2.50 at, at a cafe, if, if that's even possible anymore, and you swipe your card and you they take out uh, they pay the the retailer two fifty, but they take out uh, they round up, so they take out fifty extra cents and they put that in your savings account. Anyway, it was a wildly successful program. It started with Bank of America saying, "Hey, we want more people to use our credit card or our debit card," and they thought first, let's just use a money clip. And if people have a money clip and they whip out their money clip, well, they'll just use their card 
uh, more, I guess. And luckily they had hired some consultants who were like, uh, I don't think so. Why don't we park that idea and, and let's just go watch your users and customers and learn how they spend money. Why do they spend money? How do they spend money? And let's really understand the end user. And then from there, we'll innovate based on sort of the insights and inspiration we have uh, from the end user. So that's what they did. That was a design thinking process. They start with the customer, like anthropologists really understanding the customer and then um, innovating from there. And they came up uh, a longer story, but they came up with the Keep the Change initiative from that, and it was wildly successful. Much that's better great. than the money clip. Yeah, that's pretty sweet. I don't because I don't think I would have ever used a money clip. No, from Bank of America, not <laughs> not happening, right? Yeah. So it sounds ridiculous, but it is also, I think, you know, we all see the world through our lens, and so we all think we have the greatest idea. It's a little bit what we were talking about, and mm. at the end of the idea, at the end of the day, it might be my greatest idea for me because I'm completely biased to see the world through what is meaningful to me or what I want. Like motivational bias is a real thing. I literally like get rid of information that is disconfirming to my belief system. So we really need to let that go in order to understand the user or the end customer to ensure that we're really meeting what they consider valuable, not what we do. So how do you apply this to a more, so Bank of America, very highly, highly retail Mm-hmm. situation, right? How, how do you take that and apply those same type of principles to say a manufacturing organization or a, you know, a, a larger scale, larger scale deal size, uh, more complex sale? Okay. So that was an innovation process, like in product, what mm-hmm. I just mentioned, like they were coming up with a new product. What we did is we said, and I think I'm answering your question. We said, wait a second, these tools of customer centricity, these tools of really being curious about your end customer, these tools of another one is co-creation, iteration. Those are all from design really apply to the sales environment. And so, and they particularly apply in a complex sale when we don't know the answers and we need to learn more together. So what we did is we said, okay, sellers, I don't care where you sit, but you're in complex sales, whether it's manufacturing or tech or FinServe, let us sort of cherry pick which of the tools from the world of design are actually going to add sort of high value to your deal cycle. And so we sort of curated these different tools, discovery being a big one uh, to help sellers be more effective. And, you know, the number one request we get at Somersault is help us do better discovery, right? Because we're sellers, like we want to close. We're sort of wired for the money. We're wired for the close. And what that does is limit actually our understanding of the customer and the opportunity. And there are so many great tools from the world of design thinking in the discovery space. Can we dive into those? Do you <laughs> mind, do you mind sharing a little? Cause that's, that's fantastic. And I, I know just from comments from listeners and that's one of the biggest things that yeah. they obviously are, are focused on, right. Is yeah. how I, how I discover and how I uh, truly understand what's going on within the other organization I'm working with. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I'll tell you too, and I'll give you an example. Okay. So I was just working with a team uh, that are in high tech, complex sales, one of the biggest tech companies around that you know of. Um, And their uh, customer was a Canadian insurance company. And so they already had a footprint there and they were looking forward to this innovation day uh, with their CHRO and also head of sustainability to talk more about what their technology could do and AI coming down the pike and all these good things. And so uh, we were coaching them and they'd gone through our sell by design training and then moved into the coaching phase. And I worked with them to say, well, hold on a second. Um, I'm sure they want to hear about your great new tech. It's interesting. But why don't you, first of all, figure out first and foremost, what do they care about? What are their big priorities? We always say like, what are their big bets over the next three to five years? And one of the things they knew about this insurance company is they were trying to go after uh, expanding their broker relationships. So they sell through brokers and they were trying to expand in a particular area of brokers. So, so the first, first discovery tool is, and most sellers may do this anyway, is really like articulate what are the big bets of your customer. And then the second stage we say is, okay, so if those are their big bets, who are the end user or customer sets that are meaningful to your customer? So in this case, with this insurance firm, the end user sets were brokers. They were call centers. They were individuals. 
you and me who might buy car insurance, health insurance, life insurance, probably not health, but life car. And so those were three different sets and there were probably others. And so then the third part is we'll link what the priorities are to the end user sets that have some relationship. And so what I just said is this, this company was really interested in expanding their footprint within the broker community by X percent. And of course, brokers are one of the end users. So then the next thing was get close to the brokers, like find out something interesting about the brokers. And so as we talked, I was saying like, okay, well, how could you get something interesting about the brokers? Because that's what your customer cares about, right? The brokers. Mm -hmm. So we said, well, wait a second, my cousin's a broker. So I'm like, call your cousin, find out what they think about this insurance company. And so he did, and he got all sorts of information. He also realized that they had a relationship with another insurance company and the brokers. And so he called into other people within his own organization to get access to that broker community and found out all sorts of information. Anyway, long story short, he then went to the, or long story long, he then went to the innovation session. And instead of talking about AI and all the technology, he asked questions about the broker community from what he had learned. He offered his insight into the broker community as a, like, I always think of it as an offering. I have something interesting. I think it's interesting to you. I don't really know, but let's talk about it. And he said, like, it changed the game. All of a sudden, he was looked at as a partner, a trusted advisor, someone who wasn't just sort of pushing technology. And it's the uh, his leader was actually in that session. She was like, he was a different person. And it absolutely changed the relationship with this customer. That is fantastic. What, one of the things I absolutely adore about what you just said, and very few people I've ever talked to say it, is you've expanded the definition. You expanded the definition of discovery mm-hmm. from directly with the client that you are trying to sell to, mm-hmm. to a rep taking that and using every means available, every tool, the kind of the get it done factor, right? To find out information about that company, about the impacts, about how they're going to work with it. So it's not just the questions we ask of a single individual. Mm-hmm. You, we are asking, we're asking ourselves, how do I best find out the information that matters? Yes. And I think the other thing we're suggesting is don't just look for information about the problems that your solution solves. Like, that's a very narrow window, right? Mm -hmm. If that's all you're asking about and that's all you're looking for, expand your lens and start to sort of think about more widely. What does your customer care about? What do your end, their end customers care about sort of what's the land of opportunity. And then you can narrow, but I guarantee you, you're going to uncover many more opportunities that way than just sticking with looking for what problems that you can solve with your solution. But one of the things I, another thing I love about this, I, I have harped on for a while and, and listeners to harp is, I don't know if it's the right word, but a lot of listeners, the program on, well, no, is that I think we're at a, a, we're at a deficit a lot of times, especially with, with uh, newer salespeople of, of mm-hmm. the business basics, right. Of the understanding relative to really just how, how companies make money and market mm-hmm. and then how to apply what they do to how the companies mm-hmm. make market and mm-hmm. yep. make money and product. But what I love about your approach is you just described a way where they still know the need, the business basics, but it's on them to go search for those in relation to a specific deal and not limit themselves to a, like I said, that conversation with that one person, which is where you get, where people get stuck all the time. Yeah, exactly. And part of the initiative that we were working on was, not only to increase stage one and stage two pipeline, but also to expand the number of business decision makers that they were in relationship and particularly beyond IT. Well, this is one way to do it because all of a sudden you can have conversations about things other than IT, like have conversations with whatever sort of the executive, the HR executive, let's say, you know, sort of looking at talent uh, and recruitment of brokers. Like now I can have that conversation versus just the tech um, if I have done my research. So can I ask a question uh, Mm -hmm. around that? How do you dive in and coach reps Mm -hmm. on that very specific thing? Because a lot of times, so I'm in the tech world and a lot of times the tech world gets very focused on providing all the solutions Mm -hmm. to the reps, right? Mm -hmm. So here's your, here's your zoom info. Here's your DNB. Here's this. Okay. Here it is. It should all be for you in your CRM. But the, 
the, the reality of it is it's not going to be, it's not ever going to be, um, there's going to be a lot more information, but it's yeah. never going to be all the information that you can gather that'll help. help. So how do you coach reps on what is enough, what's too yeah. much and how to go do it? Yeah, it's a good question. I was also thinking about this idea of like how much discovery do you do? Right. Yeah. So I think, you know, um, you have to, you have to make your own assessment and gauge the value of the customer. Like, is this a, you know, $10,000 deal or is this a $10 million deal potential? And if it's a $10,000 deal uh, and or it's not a strategic account, I may not do as much discovery. I may get online. I could look at customer forums. I could look at sort of reviews. I can, you know, sort of find things online versus going out and actually talking to people because I don't have the time or it's not worth my time. Mm -hmm. If it's a 10, you know, the one I'm telling you about is multi-million, multi-year deal, then it's very much worth you figuring out where so first of all, that, I, that sort of connection point I made, which is which are the end user sets that connect to the priorities of your customer? And then within that, how can I get good information? And then how much information do I want? And I really think it's a judgment call. I also think that as you do this, obviously you get smarter about what's worthwhile, what's not. But I also think it gets a little addictive because all of a sudden you b- build your own credibility. You feel much more confident because I talk to your brokers. I have something to say, actually. And I have a story to tell you. I'm not just reading off my marketing sell sheet. I have real information. And I bet you're interested because few of us are not interested in what our customers have to say <laughs> or end user sets. So um, I really, I mean, it's not an easy answer. I think you have to gauge um it as an individual, but I also think you have to put yourself in the shoes of whomever you're going to speak to, like, what would they find valuable, right? So therefore, have I found enough information or enough stories that I think, Paul, you're going to be interested in hearing this? I did this once with another, it was a, um, you know, like an online graphic company, like, like Miro, Miro, Envision, that kind. And I knew one of their customers and I knew the person who had been a potential buyer and I knew why he did that he didn't actually buy. So I interviewed him to find out why not. And so then I was able to say, you know, in a very respectful way, I've talked to a very few number of your customers and actually one who chose not to buy. Would, are, are you interested in hearing what they have to say? Like, of course they were. Mm-hmm. So, oh, that's, that's fantastic. No, I, I, I love that. I love how you have uh, positioned this and and brought in that idea of of design thinking to it. So in design thinking is one of the stages or discovery is one of the stages yeah. to design yeah. thinking. Right? Yes. What are what are the other four because you said yeah. five stages, right? I did. And for sales we sort of boiled it down to three because okay. I'm a seller. Yep. <laughs> I don't have a long attention span. Don't give me five stages if you can give me three. So we made it into the three, which is discovery, insight and acceleration. So, and what that means is you've done your discovery. Now, how do you translate that into something that's insightful? And that doesn't mean you need my solution. Insightful that your customer would care about. And the sort of design lens through which we see insightful is sort of what can you say that's related to business and business outcomes? What's related to people and what they care about? And what's related to technology and, you know, what they care about there. You know, either what's working well or what's amiss or a question. Something about actually, and in particular, highlighting that that people piece. So that's insight. So you're translating all this discovery you've done into something insightful you want to share with your customer. And just a sort of side note or tip is it's your, your aim isn't to be right, your aim is to engage. So I might say, this is what I've learned. This is my point of view. What's yours? And you might say, actually, I, I see it differently. Awesome. Tell me what you see, right? It's a, just a way to start getting you in the game with me. So that's insight. And then acceleration is all about how do we start to accelerate the deal by co-creating the solution together versus, okay, here's my, solu- here's my solution for you. What do you think? Uh, I never want to, you never, I, I said, you should never use the word never or always. So I think it's, you're, it's risky to turn something over that doesn't have the fingerprints of your customer on it. 
Do you, um, so in the back of my mind, I hear, uh, you know, hundreds and hundreds of reps saying, well, what my solution only does one or two things Mm -hmm. like what I only have these different features. What, uh, what do you mean by Mm co-create co-create that solution when my solution is what my solution is? Yeah. Okay. Great question. Well, I guess I would, you know, if you were a rep asking me that question, I would say, well, what can they influence or what does co-creation mean to you? And it could be as simple as, um, tell me about the colors you want this, Mm -hmm. you know, what would be useful to you or what would make you feel like really proud of what's being offered in your information, in your organization or something very simple that puts their fingerprints on it, or they can sort of massage the communication, let's say out to the organization around how you're going to be talking about this Uh, all the way to like, we're literally co-creating what this technology is going to do in your system. Right. You asked me about the lower end of that. It's a very simple solution. But I think of, um, I just would, would think about this sort of the fundamental notion that we support what we own or have created. Like none of us have probably washed a rental car. Well, it's not yours. <laughs> right? so, Great analogy. Uh so just figure a way to put their fingerprints on it. That is awesome. <laughs> no, that is a great analogy. And that is so true, right? It's, uh, and I asked that as a little bit of a uh, provocative question because um, I understand completely for everything from the implementation and how you're going to work with them on the implementation instead of just telling them, you know, okay, so here, what are, here's this idea. Yeah. We got a best practice. How do you want to apply that? Yeah. All of those, those items. One of the things that struck me when you were talking about the discovery insight and acceleration, it's, and I know you've probably read a lot of the books out there too. I, I actually, I love the authors of uh, challenger sale and mm-hmm. I, I uh, got a chance to talk with them on their latest book too, the jolt, but I never thought the the challenger, like I, I never thought that that challenger sale and needing to challenge somebody was the, necessarily the true the true key right Mm -hmm. i thought it was but tell me a little bit about this insight and accelerate because i think that's more along the lines that i think of when Mm -hmm. i think of how how we can create co-create that value Mm -hmm. for people Mm -hmm. Uh, so you're saying tell tell you more about what's yeah tell me more about your about yeah sorry insight and acceleration in reference to insight you're not sitting them down, you're not challenging them with new ideas or telling them they're wrong or yes. you're, what are you doing instead? Yeah. Well, I'm kind of, um, again, it's, it's a little bit like I'm trying to discover for them with them, what might be a, a problem worth fixing. Right. I'm sort of like I, the, the, another design idea is like become a problem finder first before you're a problem, find a solution, a, a problem solver. So, with this insight, once I have this information and I have something to say to you about like, this is what I realize about your broker community in terms of why they would sign up with you and why they wouldn't. And let's say just to to sort of offer that up, not to challenge them, but to get their point of view and to start getting them to help me articulate this world in which we could actually play together. Mm -hmm. So they might say, well, actually, I hadn't heard that before. And this is something else I've heard about this other broker community in this geo, let's say. And I might say, okay, well, tell let's talk about this. Are there other broker communities actually that you could introduce me to that I could do further discovery with? Like that is another great technique because then you're becoming kind of a consultant and people will often say, yeah, like, would you talk to these couple of brokers and let me know what you hear? So you're building, you're sort of iterating towards this like problem set that we both agree on. And then you're moving to this co-created solution. And I think, you know, there are lots of different tools that you could use. One tool that I love is just whiteboarding. So I might, often I'll create a a mural. I love mural as a, a whiteboarding application. And I'll sort of lay out, let's say we've identified the problem, we've identified where we want to go and what are the success metrics. And then I I sort of outline in draft form what I would think of 
and I come back and I say, will you join me on this mural? And I'm going to talk you through and I want to hear what you like or don't like as we go. And I put stickies along each one so that I'm getting their perspective and feedback as I go. And so there I'm like moving towards this co-creative solution. Then I reiterate it and come back with that. And then we move again. See, I think that's so, I think that's so powerful. I use Miro to do a lot of the Mm -hmm. same different Mm -hmm. stuff because we build a lot of process, but I think it's so powerful to be able to help them in help a customer. I mean, because it's truly a service, right? To help a customer see one that you understand their problem, but then see it in a different way. Yeah. And the, I always got left at I, I am a whiteboard addict. When it's yeah. in a room, I'm the one that stands with the marker. Yeah. I'm at it because I just, I doodle. I doodle all the time. That's how I, that's how I take notes. I could show you my notes from our yeah. conversation. There's a lot of arrows and points, but being able to bring that and actually then bring that insight in a way that they, it, it's a really creative way to bring that insight in a way that helps them uh, receive it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And understand it. And um, the other thing we've done, if we back up just in the insight, we will, I will, as much as I can possibly can, I will do this research up front, which includes either end customers and or other employees in the organization. So we, we tend to sell to CROs or heads of enablement. We tend to work with sellers or teams. Mm -hmm. And so I'll always want to interview sellers or uh, team members before or shortly thereafter talking to the CRO or head of enablement. And then I will capture what the people have said and put it into themes and show them that and say, like, these are things I've heard. Like what strikes you from what I've heard? You know, what would you add? What would you disagree with? And then that's another way to start the conversation. Wow. That's fantastic. No, this is, and this is going to be so helpful. I, I truly appreciate you spending the time with us today. This is going to be really helpful. Any other things around design thinking that you want to, to drop, uh, mm-hmm. drop knowledge on people with like, it, like <laughs> what, what, what have you found? I, I think I was the, the, the lamest way to ever say drop knowledge, but uh, you know, my, my son says it at some point in time. Um, <laughs> I haven't heard that before. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> sorry, but anything else that you want to add that you want to, you want to tie in and kind of tie this in a bow for everybody. Yeah. I, well, there's a quote that I really like. I've been writing an article with a, an account executive from a, another tech firm that we've worked with who just closed one of the largest deals in the history of this company. It's a $14 million deal. And he did this kind of co-creation process with the customer. And uh, two things I want to say. One of the things that if you can sort of get permission up front, let's say it's a big deal and you say to your customer, you know, I... I believe that we can really do some amazing things together. But first, I'd really like to do some discovery in your organization and interview of various sets of people. And then I'm going to bring it back to you and your colleagues, you and your executive team, and tell you what I heard. And I'll do that a couple times. Would you be willing to engage with this, with me? Like the minute they say yes, that's a big deal. You've got their permission, you've got their buy-in. And then you can do that work and they're very interested in what you learn. The second thing is his... His colleague said to him, the minute your customer agrees to a co-creation process, the deal is done. He said, you don't know how big it is. You don't know exactly what it's going to be. But believe me, it's done because now they have their fingerprints on it. And so if like, I just love that idea of like, if we can co-create something together, we're both going to want to own it. We don't know what it's going to be, but it'll be something special that's that we've created together. So for what that's worth. It's worth it's worth its weight in in gold. Uh, I think that's brilliant, and I thank you so much for coming on. How do people yeah. find uh, you and your partner? Yeah, so um, Justin and I are the co-founders of Somersault Innovation. You can find us online, somersaultinnovation.com, and that's somersault as if you would do a somersault, S O M, not summertime. And I'm also on LinkedIn, Ashley Welch. Find me on LinkedIn. I'd love to hear from you, and um, you'll find my email there as well. Can you can you answer me one quick question? Why somersault? Yeah. What what I mean now I have a now I have an image of you. If, you, if people are watching this, I have an image of Ashley rolling down a hill yeah. in okay. the summertime for some reason. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, it became because my girls at the time had been in gymnastics, and Justin sort of thought of them as doing somersaults, and he sort of came up with this idea, and we liked it because it like it means it's something that everybody can do. It's also uh, a way to see the world through a different, a different lens, a different way. You see the world upside down from a different vantage point. So that's Somersault. 
And I, you know, one thing I forgot to mention is we did write a book full of these handy tricks and tips called Mm -hmm. Naked Sales, which has, is full of stories, full of tips, few drawings, super easy. I'm a seller. I don't like to read long books. This is not long. So Naked Sales, uh, you can find it on Amazon. That's awesome. We will put the link uh, in all the podcasts. I, Ashley, I'm I'm so glad that we're working with you. I'm so glad this uh, we or had a chance to get this out. Um, everybody, make sure you go to Amazon. Naked Sales is the book. Make sure if uh, you're interested in any of this, you're reaching out to Ashley on LinkedIn and at SummersaltInnovation.com. And uh, let's rock and roll. Let's close it up here. And thank you, everybody, for, for coming today. Keep shining bright and have an absolutely beautiful day. Thank you so much for listening to The Art and Science of Complex Sales. This podcast is sponsored by Membrane and our partners from around the globe. Here at Membrane, we believe that B2B sales is at a crossroads. Due to decades of quantity-based prospecting, information overload, and really a shift towards efficiency over service and pitching over leadership in sales, customers are saying enough is enough. They're tuning out average performers and choosing to take most of the buying journey on their own. This results in up and down sales results, forecasts that are all over the place, and salespeople that are half committed due to the fact that they're having poor results and they have an inability to truly connect with customers. We believe the road successful companies are taking to combat this is threefold. Number one, training to create leaders and executives across all areas of the team with strong habits and sales methodologies that bring value. Number two, technology. Technology that focuses and helps a salesperson succeed and reinforces great habits rather than wasting their time on filling out fields for reporting or wasting their time on spamming customers that have no interest in ever buying. Third, talent. And I'm talking about talent that's empowered and emboldened to make a difference for their customers and their companies. So where are you on that journey? Membrane and our network of partners across the globe are here to help and to elevate the sales profession. We streamline critical technology by combining CRM, training and enablement, and more into one seamless platform. We drive best-in-class methodologies through our partners. They provide the top thought leadership methodologies and resources from across the globe. And our collective efforts are dedicated to recruiting, training, coaching, and empowering, and measuring the habits of the top teams in the world to ensure success. Join us at Membrane.com to learn more. And thank you so much for listening.